All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I hope everyone had a restful Thanksgiving weekend with family and loved ones. Uh, we know starting this week, it's a race to the end of the semester. So we really appreciate, appreciate you all taking the time to be with us today. My name is Hayne Lee. I'm the Director of Programs and Evaluation here at the Dream.us. Today's Partner College Power Hour session is titled, In Their Own Words, Applying Scholar Voices and Data to Scale Impact. This is a packed hour, so we are going to get started right away. So in this session, we will focus on why data is so central to our work and supporting undocumented student success by sharing key takeaways from our latest annual scholar survey and what our scholars had to say about their college and career experiences during the past 2022-2023 academic year. We'll talk about how we apply our data both internally at the dream.us and externally with our partner colleges uh, and beyond to scale impact and suggest how you can utilize your partner college survey reports that were emailed just before this session to you today. You may not have received a report if you're a new partner college and you don't have scholars on campus or you're a current partner college no longer accepting new scholars or have fewer than five students who responded to that survey but the majority of our colleges should have received their latest partner college survey report. We'll then spotlight two of our partner colleges that are already utilizing last year's survey data to inform best practices on campus and raise institutional knowledge and awareness on who undocumented students are. And as always, we'll conclude the session with program updates. So our partner college presenters today are Dr. Raven Jones, Director of the Center for Student Empowerment at the University of Houston in Texas. Dr. Jones's role includes overseeing the Dream.us program at U of H, where we have now enrolled 600 the Dream.us scholars to date. And we're also joined by Dr. Cynthia Carvajal, Director for Undocumented and Immigrant Student Programs, UISP, and Mahir Sadid, Design and Social Engagement Assistant at UISP, both from the City University of New York. Dr. Carvajal oversees undocumented student initiatives across the CUNY system, where we have enrolled over 1,900 the Dream.us scholars to date. So to set the context for today's conversation, many of our partner colleges and institutions of higher ed across the country do not identify undocumented students in their data for security reasons and to protect students. The Dream.us is uniquely positioned to collect and analyze data on our 10,000 plus undocumented students across the country. However, we are but the tip of a very large iceberg. So we feel it's crucial for colleges and universities to take measures to de-identify and safely proxy the presence of undocumented students on campus because there is such a significant gap in knowledge on a rapidly growing portion of the college student population. Right now, there are over five and a half million immigrant origin college and students, college students in the United States meaning those who immigrated to this country themselves or were born to immigrant parents. These students make up one in three of all college students in the United States, and 80% are students of color. While there are several estimates on what portion of this population is undocumented, it's still unclear who undocumented college students are and the scale of their presence on college campuses nationwide. At the dream.us, as you all know, we collect data year round through our application, renewals and surveys, because we believe it's so central to our work that we, we hear directly from our scholars and alumni at scale to guide internal decision-making processes, but also to institutionalize best practices for supporting college and career success on campuses and tell the incredible stories of our 10,000 plus scholars and alumni to support advocacy efforts to push for policy changes at the state and federal level. This urgency is elevated given that the majority, 70% of our 4,600 plus scholars enrolled for this academic year are fully undocumented without work authorization and over 80% of our incoming freshmen are undocumented without work authorization. And the particular challenges that you all are seeing on your campuses that our current scholars face in college and as they prepare for life after college is evident in our data and is representative of the much larger population of undocumented college students nationwide. I'm now going to hand it over to our senior research analyst, Vernisa Donaldson, who will share more about our latest 2023 scholar survey. 
Hi, everyone. So as Haynes said, um, the focus for today's P uh, PC Power Hour and some of the insights that we'll be hearing from some of our colleagues a little later is based in part on data from our annual scholar survey. And so the survey for the 2022-23 academic year went out earlier this year, um, starting early May and ending uh, late June, uh, with the goal for us to get some in-depth feedback from our scholars about their experiences on campus, about their experiences with us as a program, and overall their college and career experiences. And so the participation for the survey this year was fantastic. Uh, I'm happy to say that we heard back from over 3,100 of our scholars and achieved an 84% response rate, which says to us that at the program level, we're gaining a pretty good understanding of what our scholars' experiences are and that they're reflective of the experiences that our scholars are having. Uh, next slide. And so we know that one of the critical factors for academic success for scholars are, is the connections that they create on campus. So when they engage with their peers, when they work with faculty on academic projects, um, and when they have supportive staff to help them navigate the ins and outs of their college degree journey. And so in the scholar survey, we ask our scholars about their interactions with a few key groups on campus to get a sense of what their engagement is like and what those interactions are like for them on campus. And so they rate these interactions on a scale of one to seven, where one is poor and seven is excellent. And on this slide, we have um, just a sample of the few groups that we have, the key um, faculty and staff that support scholars' um, academic success. And so what we see across the board is that for the scholar advisors, professors, academic advisors, and career services staff, our scholars are telling us that their interactions with these groups are going pretty well. Um, and then for the first three groups, we see that over the last two academic years that the ratings for these interactions are ticking up very slightly. And for the career services staff, we only have one year of um, one academic year of data so far because we asked about that um, for the first time on the most recent survey as the focus for career services um, increases as a program and on our campuses. But for the other three groups overall, they're having good experiences with these groups and um, it's increasing um, slightly. And so what I like to think about these, um, what these ratings for these groups represent is basically a spotlight, right? So it could be spotlight on things that are working. So if you have ratings that are five or above or you're at or above the dream.us averages for these groups, you can understand that something with these groups is working and try to get a better understanding of, you know, what's going right there. On the other hand, if the ratings are below the dream.us's average or you're seeing ratings of four or lower, or in some instances when you have the prior academic year data, if you're seeing ratings go lower, then that's an area of concern to start to dig to understand maybe what's causing, you know, those low ratings, those decreases in ratings. And so really it's important as a starting point for figuring out what's behind the trends, right? Is there an issue of, you know, staff not knowing how to work with undocumented students? Is it a time or a capacity issue? Um, really something to start to help understand so that the um, interactions for the scholars and their experiences can be improved or um, in the case where things are going well, can be continued and built upon. And then um, along with that, one of the things that we know is that it's really, really critical for our scholars to be meeting with their scholar advisor every year to review their progress towards their degree, um, any issues or challenges that they might be facing currently or that are coming up um, to get resources and supports, um, things like that. And so the, that advisement piece and having that consistent touch point on campus for engagement is a really key part of scholars' ability to persist towards degree completion. So on the scholar survey, we ask our scholars if they've met with their scholar advisor once per term for the previous academic year. And so they can report that they either met that once per term, that they met um, with their scholar advisor once in the past academic year, that they didn't have the chance to, or that they weren't able to get in touch with their scholar advisor, which is really critical. And so for the 22-23 academic year, we see that we have about two thirds 
of our scholars who met with their scholar advisor at least once in the past academic year. And for the other third, we have 22% who didn't have the chance and 11% who couldn't get in touch with their scholar advisor. And so as with the previous slide, this, is, this can be a good starting point for understanding what's going on to produce these results. So if, scholar, if scholars can't meet with their scholar advisor because of their own barriers or not being able to get in touch with their scholar advisor, how could that potentially be remedied? And on the other hand, if a majority of your scholars are meeting with their scholar advisor at least once a year, then you know that you're on the right track with that and other data points might become more salient for building out those additional supports. So really it's, un, it's important to consider these data points as a window into your scholars' experiences and a starting point for learning and decision-making. Thank you, Bernisa. Uh, I'll just quickly add here that the reason why we chose to highlight these two data points too is because of the value of student engagement on campus. We all know that student engagement with different agents on campus, whether that be a professor, an advisor, is very uh, much correlated to students and their persistence and their graduation rates. And especially for undocumented students who may face uh, steeper barriers for a sense of belonging on campus, we believe that having that point of engagement with an academic advisor, with a scholar advisor is so important to their success and has been anecdotally delivered to us also in our qualitative data in response to, for example, what factors are critical to your college journey and your college success. So we'll transition here to a couple of slides on career development and the financial needs of our scholars. Here you'll see the percentage of uh, scholars working while in school and how it's shifted over time. For those of you who have been with us for longer, you'll recognize this chart. For those of you who are newer, you'll see that we've been collecting this data for a couple of years. So pre-COVID on the left, you'll see that the majority of our scholars had DACA, they had TPS, 75% were working in blue. And you see that percentage drop to 45% during COVID. And while we saw it increase slightly over the next two academic years, to back up to about two out of three scholars working in addition to school, we see another dip down to 59% in this most recent academic year. So if we just hone in on the 59% from this past academic year and we break it out by whether or not a scholar has work authorization, you see the contrast in percentages and where those barriers become steeper depending on a student's immigration status. So the majority of scholars with work authorization on the left are still working 72% and only about half of those on the right without work authorization have an income opportunity and the other half are seeking a career opportunity. So what we like to speak to is the increased barriers for undocumented students face in making money in accessing uh, career development opportunities. We've definitely seen a jump in the percentage of scholars saying they need additional financial aid assistance for academic assistance over the year. This year, 41% said this was their top need uh, compared to 30% last year. That's the statistic on the left. If we look at the figure on the right, uh, we see that this is coupled with the lack of inclusive career development opportunities while in college. So that red bar there represents the percentage of our scholars who are unable to complete an internship in the past academic year. And our scholars consistently tell us that this is something that they would like but especially given their immigration status, they don't find as many paid opportunities that are accessible to them. So why share all this data? Uh, the data and the reports you receive provide key insights into the very expansive areas for increased support. It hits everything from academic success to sense of belonging on campus to career supports, but we can't be everything to everyone. And every organization and institution, as we all know, has finite resources, funds, time, capacity, and so what we want to do here today is provide examples and suggestions on how maybe you as an individual and or a team on campus can utilize this data as a tool to make strategic decisions on targeting specific areas to scale to impact. We'll give you an example internally from the dream.us. So over the years, we've been hearing from scholars the increasing need for additional financial aid that we just shared. Last year, as most of you know, we decided to increase our annual stipend from $1,000 to $1,500. Uh, here you see the announcement that we sent out to our scholars emphasizing how we listened to what they said and acted. Although that $500 isn't a large amount of money from the student perspective, internally this was a really difficult decision for us because we had to pull future scholarship dollars, future funds for prospective students to provide that additional support for current scholars 
but we decided this was a significant need to support college completion, which is our main strategic goal. So we were also fortunate to have a donor step up for another round of emergency funds. And we're also based on this data piloting, as you all know, a number of career initiatives, including internship and fellowship funding programs, as we consistently see in the data that this is a high area of need for those career development, experiential learning opportunities, regardless of immigration status. And what we learn from these pilots will determine where we go deep in terms of our future programming. And then if we look externally uh, at the dream.us, we believe we have the responsibility to partner with you all, other organizations in this space to elevate public awareness of who undocumented college students are and who our graduates are to push for state and federal level change. We're showcasing a couple uh, examples of reports here. I see Chris dropping the links in the chat uh, that we published over the years telling the very powerful narrative of how a college degree and work authorization meaningfully impacts the social mobility of undocumented individuals and their communities. So in last year's alumni survey report, we published in partnership with Golden Door Scholars, we were so proud to be able to say that of the 1400 graduates we surveyed, 94% are employed, self-employed and contributing to the American workforce. They're working in key industries of need like health and medicine, education. We're able to demonstrate that 50% of our alumni are out earning their parents combined, that one in 10 are homeowners, and this makes a really compelling case for things like in-state tuition and aid equity, licensure equity, and pathways to permanency for individuals who we know are so deeply ingrained in the fabric of our country. And these are the types of narrat narratives you can tell as well about the impact of your institution on the lives of undocumented students. And we believe that the data that we're providing can support that narrative uh, in partnership with you all. Uh, so to conclude this part of the presentation, just wanted to highlight a couple do's and don'ts here. So data we know can help us understand the students we serve. It's an opportunity to learn at scale, especially because we have 10,000 plus scholars across the country. We can identify trends, start conversations with a colleague in your department, across campus, across the state, and even across the country. There are many folks on this call from across the country, especially with a community of practitioners working towards the same goal. What we don't want to do is to use this to, uh, data to create success or failure narratives in that binary by creating metrics that we must up, uh, meet or up, uphold to prove success. So if numbers look a low in a particular area, as Bernisa was mentioning, we can ask questions about the context. And data is always all about context, asking questions about why this may be, what we could be doing to improve supports available is a, is is this a question of capacity, as oftentimes it is, and what are the additional resources that may be needed? So one tangible platform to build that local and or national momentum, obviously, is to meet and collaborate with others doing this work. We believe that this Partner College Power Hour is one space to do that. I know you all are connecting uh, during the session and post-session but also a friendly reminder that the next success convening is taking place on March 29th through the 30th, 2024 at Rice University in Houston, Texas. This is the only conference for practitioners in higher ed that's solely dedicated to the topic of supporting undocumented student success. Many of you here likely attended last year's inaugural convening and next year's convening will specifically focus on career equity in and after college. So the conference and the sessions will go deep on graduate school, experiential learning opportunities in college, and postgraduate pathways for undocumented individuals with a focus on those without work authorization. So pulling a plug here, I'm seeing the link to the registration in the chat. Just FYI, our partner colleges receive a 30% discount on that registration with a very difficult discount code member. Uh, and sneak peek, I'll say if you attend our last December PC Power Hour of the year, we will be giving away a registration package for one partner college team. That's a value of up to $1,000. So last year we did a, a smaller scale giveaway at our last annual partner college Power Hour, but Chris will have more details on that at the end of today's session. So then I'll pass it back to Bernisa quickly to talk about your partner college survey reports. Um, yeah, so as Hayne mentioned, the reports for the most recent scholar survey, so the 2022-23 scholar survey, have gone out to um, your teams at your colleges. 
Um, you can use this report to get some detailed insights about your scholars' experiences at your college across a really broad range of topics. Like there's a lot in those reports. And so with that said, as you're going through the report, if you have any questions about it, please feel free to reach out to me and Hain um, if we can help clarify anything. And we'll also be following up very soon with an overview report for the program as a whole. So you can look at the two reports side by side to have some additional context about what you're seeing for your scholars in your own report as in comparison to the program overall. So look out for those in your inboxes. Thank you, Vernisa. Okay, so uh, now how do you actually implement all of this on your campus? You've heard enough from us at the dream.us. So we'll transition to our first partner college spotlight. We'll have Dr. Raven Jones share a specific example of how the University of Houston has been utilizing survey data on campus. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Raven Jones. Um, as a scholarship advisor at University of Houston, um, with our scholars, we get our data and then do a couple of things. So I was telling Hayne and Chris about it, and they said, well, can you break it down a little bit and show what you do per question and what you do as soon as you get your data? And I will let y'all know now, I just pulled my data up just now and looked at my questions y'all sent this morning. So if I was looking like I was looking at two screens, it's because I was already looking at the questions right now. I'm trying to see which students have uh, answered which questions and which ones didn't. So um, we look really extensively at our data and goals for our usage. And once we get the data itself, I look at it first as a scholarship advisor, myself and with the team. So first with our team, myself, our CSC team, and then with our UH team. And then we look at it overall for goals of what we need to, to look at for strategic planning purposes. Anywhere between five to 11 goals based on the questions that had a really high rating, what we're doing well, and what questions had a really maybe low rating. So when I do that for our office, I also do that for the other questions that work with offices that are not involved with ours. For example, our career team, look at their questions. Our admissions teams, look at their questions. And so I break it down per question, um, looking at what can we do strategically. Once we do that and we kind of make an informed decision about which questions we want to look at to highlight, not only for strategic purposes, but what we did well, then we go and we establish a campus-wide network. And I reach out to those partners of those questions and say, hey, can we get together through either Teams meeting or regular meeting and look at what we need to do well and what we didn't do well, and do y'all mind doing that? We usually do it about once a semester. Um, if we can meet either virtually, that's great. If not, we try to meet in person. Um, and if not, I try to meet with everybody at least once a semester, if not twice a semester, depending on whoever the liaison is at campus. So if it's an uh, admissions liaison, if it's a housing liaison, if it's our emergency aid liaison, students using our food pantry, depending on what those questions were um, that we got. So look at the questions visibly for each one, one by one, looking at our, our pain points and our growth points, and then establishing five to 11 goals of where we want to move on from there. After I do that, then we get the visible allies from each one of those offices that I talked about and say, okay, can you be the point person to contact to just, just be the person, be the growth person of this question? So for example, one year we knew that the students were having a hard time getting good admissions ad, of ad, advice and finding out how to get in, how to get their dream.us scholarship, how to get into UH and all the application processes. And so I got with admissions, found an admissions liaison, and that person reviewed the data from that point on with me of what his team was was and was not doing, what could prove on and what they were doing well. And when we did that, we noticed that, that those questions for admissions got better. Same thing with housing, same thing with um, financial aid, and same thing with our academic advisors um, on campus. So once we did that, then we asked everybody, can you be that visible point of contact? So some of us already have listed our liaison on the dream.us portal, where we have a liaison for each one of the different um, areas. So I asked that person, would you mind being on the point of contact for students, but also for this data? Once we did that, then we did the faculty and staff. So for faculty, had to meet with each one of the groups that we had for faculty senate, um, departments of education, departments of Bauer, the business department, whichever department had the biggest, um, I would say, gain, um, we'd start with those offices first. So once we looked at our data there, I would take the groups that had the most students in them. So for our doc documented group, we would look at which groups were they seeing. So if we had more students in Bauer, more students in our business office, more students in technology, I met with them first. So after we did that, we did our road show. So look at the questions, five to 11 um, goals. Then we made the visible contact with the liaison that person, went over that um, data point with that group and or that um, contact. And then we said, okay, what can we do as a group and can we meet regularly to um, fix that? 
So one of the questions I had in particular for our office that we were looking at that we were going to show highlight for today was um, this data point of meeting with the academic advisors. Why was this important for our office? This was important for our office because I'm not housing student, I'm housing student affairs and not in academic affairs. And students may see their academic advisors sometimes more than they see me um, because we have so many students on our campus um, who receive the scholarship. So what we did here, I looked at the students who received the Dream.us scholarship and then how many in which department and which department had the largest amount of those students and them first. For us, our business department, Bauer, and our technology. And I went to their um, staff meetings, faculty meetings, and asked not only the staff members with academic advisors, but also the professors um, at the faculty senate, could we meet with them and go over this information? So I set up individual meetings with the departments that had the most students and talked with them on a roadshow. So for example, with this question right here, I showed them this data point and show them this actual question that, that fit with them and had them go over it one by one in their smaller groups when I met with them saying, what does this tell us? And they were able to kind of figure out when did they see a student, what they did not know about a student, how much they know about undocumented students overall. And they were able to kind of get in their own groups from their own, I would say more organically conversations and generate what could their office do? What could their staff members do? What could their faculty and their, the professors do? So on three different levels, we had conversations of saying, if you looked at this question and you saw this, what could you what could you gain from it? And as we do that by individual level, we did institutional goals and the individual questions. What that what that did for us is that it kind of came out of the departments themselves. They decided, hey, what else can we learn? What else can we do for you? So it's kind of getting those liaisons and getting those people across campus to kind of work with us and for us to get not only to get the data out, but what could they do um, across campus? So for these two questions in particular. After I asked them to look at what does this data tell us, and I showed this on a PowerPoint to them, then I said, well, what can we change? What practice can you change? And when they did that, they said, well, what did you think that we could offer? Well, when the professors were not able to see the students a lot, they said, well, we just felt uncomfortable seeing the student. We don't know what to say to our students. We don't know how to, you know, um, for our campus, they felt that they didn't have enough information to give a student who was undocumented. And so we came, of course, with our Dream Zone Ally training. And now that training goes out to all faculty and staff who receive it during their staff meetings, and then the faculty who receive it during their onboarding meetings with their departments. So every year now, every semester, the different major groups will see this. So we did this with our honors group. We met with our business group, then our technology department. All our college departments met and had the Dream Zone Ally training. And from there, we were able to say, okay, now that you've had this training, what does that look like? So, and how to help us improve it. The second thing we did was we looked at the areas of pro that were really good for our office. So for our office as scholarship advisor was what did we do correct? Um, once you look at one question, you want to figure out not only what you may want to improve on, but what things are you doing well and how you can improve them and keep them going. And so for us, that was the meetings with me. The students kept saying, well, Dr. Jones, we want to see you a lot more. Uh, we don't have time. We can't. We feel like we can't get in with you. Can you offer more things? And that past year, I did. We saw for more drop-in hours, more physical hours. We were able to text students through our Navigate app. They can schedule directly with me on one-on-one -on -one on Outlook and Teams. And that made this number go up. And so I think beforehand, it was like a little bit low. It was like 5.85 or so um, from before. But this year, it went up a little bit more to 6.16. So not only can your data tell you stuff that you may want to grow on and areas of strategic planning to move forward with, but also what you're doing well and that you've done something really well from year to year. Amazing. Thank you, Dr. Jones. So uh, I think what was really important about what you highlighted is the spirit of conversation and collaboration. And it's not necessarily about uh, being punitive. So it's much more about uh, what does this tell us? How can we have a conversation? Not that the data is prescribing what's happening, but it's generating more questions to answer and better understand the processes and the pinpoints uh, where we can better collaborate and share information. And I think that part about working closely with faculty is very, very important. Dr. Jones, and I think the strategic steps you took to take the ally training on the roadshow, for example, is a great strategy. And then you can see it in this data. So I think that's a great transition point uh, because Dr. Jones's example is very much what's happening on the campus as we look inwards and internally. And we're gonna transition to our second partner college spotlight here, uh, which focuses a lot more at the institutional level. Uh, Dr. Cynthia Carvajal and Mike here will show uh, and share how CUNY as a system is using their own institutional data to advocate for increased resources for undocumented students as well. Thank you, Hayne. Um, thank you, Dr. Jones. That was, I, I really liked seeing your breakdown and I was taking notes on 
I'm like, oh, I need to attend some council meetings so I can let folks know like this, where we're at in our data. Um, and for and I see a lot of CUNY folks here, uh, but I, I in looking kind of of those, of those overall numbers, Haynes, and then the numbers that you sent over to each of the campuses, we're definitely lacking in financial aid, career services, and academic advisement. So I think there is there is a lot of space to use Dr. Jones's strategies to to address that. Um, but yes, thank you so much for for having me. My name is Cynthia Carvajal. I am the University Director for Undocumented Immigrant Student Programs at CUNY, as I mentioned. Um, Mahir is here as well and will be presenting. I'll I'll have him introduce himself uh, when he gets to his section. Uh, but we can go ahead and go into the to the next slide. Uh, these move, as I recently learned. Uh, Mahir is an excellent creator of many things, and so this presentation uh, will definitely be one of them as well. What we'll be talking about is how you can advocate for some institutional practices. What are some of the projects that our office is doing, as we uh, kind of colloquially call WISP, so Undocumented Immigrant Student Programs as WISP. Uh, what are some projects we're working on in order to really talk about the undocumented student experience? What are the dreams.us's uh, efforts to further understand students? So this data that, that has been showcased at the top of this presentation and how we're then utilizing those data, data sets in partnership with our projects to further advocate for increased resources. Um, and so kind of this in the next slide, the advocating for institutional practices. Um, oh, I love it. So the, the need, um, the what what we strive for in order to address the the institutional practices that are lacking at CUNY uh, and not just CUNY centrally but also across our 25 campuses uh, and so in the next slide what I want to emphasize is the goal of our office in particular so this department is very new it's about uh, two years old now. And so I'm the inaugural director of it. There wasn't something like it that existed before. And from my understanding, uh, I don't think there's a central, a similar centralized role in other university institutions. This is kind of really the only one of its kind across the country. And so my position was created at this centralized level in an effort to help create some uniformity across our 25 campuses. But in particular, what makes my uh, position and hopefully similar ones to it across other university systems is that it allows me to inform data efforts that are happening at a centralized level and prevent identifiers in those data efforts. So as I'm sure folks here know and have navigated, data is what allows us to communicate the significance, the significant presence and need of our undocumented students. But if we don't have access to that data, folks will assume that it's like a handful of undocumented students in our university systems, right? Which is not the case. Uh, we see the data that shows 100,000 possible undocumented students are graduating from high schools across the country. In New York State alone, it's over 4,000. And so what I did, because I can handle the sensitive data, because I'm familiar with the sensitive data, we developed a proxy in collaboration with the Financial Aid Office and the Office of Institutional Research to better understand how many possible undocumented students are at our campuses. And so I emphasize possible because this is, we, we don't ask our students to identify their immigration status. And so we're just going off of, of um, a kind of equation of sorts. These are, this is just data. These are just numbers. There are no identifiers attached to it. So also making sure that it's safe for other folks um, to, to see this data, to engage with this data so that we're not uh, putting our students' identities in jeopardy. But again, I'll emphasize that I, I never encourage campuses to create lists or to create equations of how they can figure out who's undocumented in their campus. Uh, my position was created in, in an effort to manage those, those data sets. And so I, I encourage other campuses to create similarly focused positions so that they can handle the data sets in, in a safe and, and protected way. Uh, but Mahir will talk more about kind of what we then utilized with this data to, to create uh, a tool for our campus. Thank you so much, Dr. Carvajal. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mahir, and I currently work as the Design and Student Engagement Assistant at CUNY Undocumented and Immigrant Student Programs and I am a current senior at Queens College. I'm really excited to share this uh, snippet of this report, which I've been designing under Dr. Carvajal's supervision for the past four months. Uh, and this report is an example of what undocumented and immigrant students can achieve if they're connected through 
paid opportunities like the dream.us. So here is the cover of the report itself. So as you can see, it includes a breakdown of students by enrollment, their access rates for state aid, how much money our campuses uh, may be leaving at the state, and also information about student enrollment and retention. By the way, again, I just want to emphasize this report does not include any identifiers. And with this report, we were able to make possible, possible assumptions of undocumented and immigrant students within CUNY. For example, in one of our campuses, we saw a significant increase in undocumented students, while in another campus, there was a decrease in PRUCO students. And knowing how our student populations are shifting across our campuses enables us to understand where to allocate funding and where to uh, allocate also resources. And on the next slide, Oh yes, thank you so much, Dr. Kabahal. Just for some context, tuition uh, TAP is Tuition Assistance Program. It's a New York State uh, grant offered to students as a part of their financial aid. But now jumping back into the report, there were two key findings from this report. First is that our students are not accessing resources to support them, which results in campuses losing out on funds. And the second major takeaway that we noticed is that despite these continuing barriers, our students are a resilient population and they continue to enroll even during the pandemic. And reiterating Dr. Carvajal's earlier point, the best research about undocumented students comes from undocumented and immigrant students themselves because this is their lived experience. This was my lived experience. And they and we have a degree of sensitivity and expertise that may often not be shared by other folks who haven't navigated being undocumented before. And so it's no surprise how important it is to include and compensate directly impacted students to support and also understand this research. And with that, I will now pass the baton off to Dr. Carvajal. Um, and so kind of this third section is to bring us back to what was presented at the top of the presentation. So there's the dream.us's efforts to also understand undocumented students. Um, what the dream.us data allows us to see, and in the next slide, it's, it's very briefly laid out. While our data focuses on quantitative experiences, right? So we can see uh, retention rates, enrollment rates, uh, GPA rates, what, how many percentage of, of classes or credit students are passing. These are all quantitative numbers, but they don't necessarily showcase the sense of community that students are building, whether they're able to connect to relevant resources, whether the resources are accessible um, and available to them at their campuses. So like I said, uh, financial aid from, from the data that we have from the dream.us. Uh, financial aid advisement is not doing very well for Dream.us scholars at CUNY in comparison to, to the Dream.us overall. And the same can be said for career services and academic advisement. And so uh, what then we're hoping to do is to further advocate for resources by meshing the, the two data sets. And so this is our fourth point in this presentation. Um, so preparing to uh, partnering to advocate for increased resources. So how can our team, the dream.us team, accelerate these efforts? One of the ways in which we're hoping to do this is by presenting this information at the Council of Presidents meeting. And so this is the meeting where all the college presidents come together um, and we are able to then present this data, both our quantitative data that folks don't necessarily have access to, but also the dream.us's data to further highlight the lived students' experiences at the campuses. And so this creates a richer narrative to capture the undocumented student experience at CUNY. Um, and I think also allows us to create a sense of usefulness of the data uh, so that folks don't just see it as kind of numbers that are being flown around, but really something that's that's speaking to, to the student experiences that they care about. Um, so this is what, what we're hoping to then see at the at the this meeting that that um, Mahir, Hain, and I will be presenting us is to communicate a clearer sense of the population impacted by the lack of resources. But in particular, what has always kind of been the goal of, of my department and folks that are from CUNY can, can attest to this is that we're interested in advocating for full-time staff dedicated to this work and centers at the campuses. So CUNY currently has uh, technically 
three immigrant student success centers at John Jay, Brooklyn, and uh, City College that's opening next semester. Full-time staff, Hunter College has a full-time staff member. Uh, in addition to what is also present at John Jay, Brooklyn, and, and City College, but this is not uh, across all of our 25 campuses. This is only four campuses uh, from, from the 25. And so when uh, our data sets can show that there is a larger amount of population, a larger population size of undocumented students than folks had previously anticipated. And although liaisons are designated at each of the campuses, some dream.us liaisons here are also liaisons for immigrant students across your campus that's not sufficient support for, for undocumented students. That's why we see kind of a lack of, of resources or a disproportionate amount of access to resources in financial aid, in career services, um, and in other resources that our dream.us scholars are looking for and our undocumented students are, are looking for as well. Uh, so that, that's the hope with combining the data sets. Uh, there are two kind of key points that we really wanna emphasize when, when doing this. And so uh, Mahir will talk about one of those key points in the next slide. So the first key point that we want to talk about is how important it is to include and pay directly impacted students to contribute to this work, because this, by incorporating undocumented students and their experiences as a part of this work through paid leadership positions, it creates intentionality and accountability. And so what does that mean? The report that you just saw is an example of what undocumented and immigrant students can achieve when they're connected to paid career opportunities that allow them to expand and learn their skills and lean into their lived realities. In my case, for example, although I didn't unfortunately qualify for the dream.us at the time when I was applying due to year of arrival requirements, I became connected to this work because of the Immigrant Ambassador Program, which was a partnership between uh, the CUNY and the New York City Department of Education. And that enabled me to find alternative forms of uh, paid employment, which allowed me to continue being invested in this work to support my fellow, uh, fellow undocu folks. And then eventually that work uh, kind of uh, laddered me towards another experience where I was able to receive legal aid, which ultimately enabled me to now work at CUNY with Dr. Carvajal as a college assistant. So what I'm trying to sort of convey in this point is that it's important to take advantage of the funds that the dream.us provides to create these opportunities and to collaborate with students to advocate for more resources because some of the most uh, sort of ingenious ideas are the ones that are coming from your students because their everyday realities are living undocumented, studying undocumented and trying to thrive while being undocumented. And with that, I will pass off the mic to Dr. Carvajal to explain the second point. Uh, and the second point is to that it's important to note that uh, I think the data sets that the dream.us provide are really incredible. And these are students that, as you know, have tuition covered, they get a stipend on top of that, they get access to an advisor, and, and they know how to, they're able to identify these resources that are available to them. But this is this at your campus, this may be just a percentage of the undocumented student population at your campus. And so if dream.us students are struggling to access resources, students who don't have the dream.us scholarship are also struggling or struggling even more, right? And so I, I always wanna emphasize that because I think it's possible to include both dream.us scholars and those who are not dream.us scholars in these efforts uh, be because students who don't have access to the scholarship are, are also having to work more hours than, than their dream.us counterparts because they also have to pay for tuition on, on their end. Um, and yes, that's it for, for us. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. And thank you, Mahir, for sharing also your own lived experiences. I think you really make a powerful point about how important access is uh, and what undocumented individuals can do when provided the platforms that are awarded to other students. So thank you for sharing that. And thank you both, Dr. Carvajal and Dr. Jones, uh, for providing very concrete suggestions, next steps on how uh, folks can utilize the data uh, in partnership with us, but also internally to guide your own uh, decision-making processes and advocate for increased resources for undocumented students. 
We will be sharing emails for our guest presenters in tomorrow's PC Weekly with the recording, uh, with the slides. Uh, but also, if you don't mind, uh, to our guest presenters, dropping your email in the chat. So should you all have immediate questions, want to connect, please feel free to reach out to our speakers who have a wealth of experience and knowledge in this space. So thank you again uh, for sharing your experiences and best practices, and we will pass it to Chris for program updates. Hola, mi gente. How are how is everybody? Always great to see my people every month here sharing with us. Um, I'm a little bit under the weather, so please excuse my voice. Um, I will try to get through these slides pretty quickly um, to give you the rest of your day back. Uh, so the first announcement is the fall 2023 EVR payments. As of last week, Wednesday, all of the um, EVR emails and payments were sent for your bulk, the bulk of your EVRs. Um, so you should have received your payments by now for the majority of your students. Um, if there were any cases of which an EVR um, missed a student or an adjustment had to be made for a student or a scholar, um, those are still, there are still a handful of those payments still being processed, uh, but we do hope to get those finalized as well within the next few weeks. Um, hopefully, um, I know I'm going to sound like a broken record and you probably all hate me already for this, but please email your scholars. Let them know that your campus has received their funding, uh, that their accounts will be will be cleared with the, with the payments very soon. Um, and if you could also please provide them um, some timeline as to when they would receive their stipends. You know, the holidays are coming up, so they are definitely on the lookout for those funds coming their way. So if you could please send that out, that would be amazing. And it will go a long, long way to, again, just hearing some of their anxieties. I also want to mention that by the end of this week, your PC uh, report, scholar reports will be updated with all of the most current information for scholar, scholar eligibility and status. So you will be able to see those updates on your reports by the end of this week so that you can check in and make sure that your students um, are doing well and uh, make sure you have the most up-to-date information regarding their scholarship eligibility. Uh, we can move to the next one uh, slide, Tane. Um, it is that time of the year where we also send emails um, and reminders to our scholars regarding their eligibility statuses. Um, and so um, just to highlight a, a couple of those, if you have a student who has either maxed out or timed out on their scholarship award this semester, but still has at least 15 or less credits um, in order to graduate, they can apply for bridge funding and they should be doing so this semester in order to have that available for them for um, the spring 2024 semester. Um, as you already know, the students can request bridge funding through the request form on their ISCS Scholar Portal. Um, I've also linked in the PowerPoint itself the two minute video that we have on how students can go through the process of applying for bridge funding. Um, another case is if you have a scholar who was not enrolled in the fall 2023 semester, uh, there are two cases. If it is a brand new scholar who just received the, app, the scholarship in the last application round and did not attend this fall semester, they are totally fine. By default, they have until spring 2024 to utilize and enroll into their partner college. So there is no action that is required from the student except enrolling in the semester for 2000, spring 2024. They do not have to complete a request form. They do not have to reach out to anyone. As long as they enroll by spring 2024, they are in good standing with the scholarship program. Um, for our continuing scholars, if they did not attend this semester and did not previously um, submit a break of enrollment request, they do still have chance to do that retroactively. Again, it is the same request form um, on their ISTS portal. And they, again, we've embedded a link here for 
our two minute video on how scholars can submit that request. For students who are um, reporting that they have already graduated, uh, they will be completing a separate form, which will be the academic records form, and that will be emailed out. They will get a link to that email, I mean, to that form with the email that is sent out to them for this notice. Um, for students who are looking, you know, it's that time of the year, students are looking to transfer to other colleges, either they've completed a um, community college degree and now going into a four-year college. If they are looking to do that, again, that would be through the request form. And we've included the video link here for students to know how to do that as well. This is all the, as we all know, the request form is specifically for our national scholars and our national scholarship program. For, for any opportunity scholars, they will not be able to have access to the request form. So they will need to email hain.lee at the dream.us to make any of these such requests. Um, recently, we've been talking about our application promo materials. Thank you everyone who filled out the Excel sheet to um, have, you, have your names on the list to get those promotional materials mailed out to you. All of our orders have been received and the delivery information has been provided to our vendor, um, D DBL, who is putting together the packages as we speak and we'll be shipping that out to you all. I wanna say within the next two weeks, those packages should be being mailed out to you. Once they are shipped, we will receive the tracking information and we'll relay that to you uh, via email so that you can also keep track of when those packages and those materials will arrive to you. Um, in addition to that, I also wanna put in a plug. We have our promotional toolkit on our website for additional ideas and tips on how you can promote the scholarship program to, go, to do better recruitment for your applications. Um, if you have any concerns regarding your application numbers, um, and I wanna remind you, you can always look at your application numbers in somewhat real time um, through your scholar, um, through your ISTS portal, you can see your application numbers as they continue to grow each week. If you do have any concerns on those numbers and are looking for ways to amplify those numbers, please reach out to your RM and we may be able to include our comms teams to help with that effort. Um, many of you know that we had a part, we have a partnership with Kaplan Prep Test Prep Course Programs um, that initially had provided free access to the test prep for the MCAT, the LSAT, the GRE, and the GMAT for our scholars. Um, that is an amazing, I don't have to tell you, um, Kaplan is an amazing program. It is quite costly. So we were grateful for Kaplan to be able to provide those exams for our students. But in further conversations with, with them, they have actually included all of these other exams and made them available to our scholars at no cost. I'm not gonna go through them all because it's like alphabet soup. So I'm just gonna sort of like, you can read them through, um, but there are programs in nursing and teaching certifications and dental certifications and much more. Um, <clears throat> so this is a great resources for your juniors and your seniors looking into going into grad schools who may need these entrance exams. Again, this is available to them at no cost. We will tell, uh, we do ask that this be made available to scholars and alum who will be sitting for an exam within six months of requesting the, the fee waiver, right? We don't want students applying for this way, way out of an advance. And then the waiver just does not become valid or, or anything of that sort. Um, I have also included the applicate, the request form for the we fee waiver here. So you'll be able to have access to that um, and when this all goes out in the PC Weekly tomorrow. Uh, we are also exploring some additional um, exams with Kaplan in the fields of insurance, real estate, securities, accounting, financial planning, financial advising, and information technology. I'm saying we are exploring because they have not made that available to us as of yet but the conversation is ongoing and this is something that we hope that we might be able to make available to our scholars as well. Um, so we will keep you posted with, with that as it comes to fruition, hopefully. 
Um, and a quick preview on next month's PC Power Hour. It will be December 9th, 19th. I'm sorry. Again, I'm a little, I'm a little under the weather. December 19th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It will be the same Zoom link as always. Uh, we know that it is going to be, you know, that time of the season is the end of the semester. Holidays are coming up. It's a lot. So we are going to try to keep the conversation kind of light and kind of um, a little bit uplifting. Um, so what more better conversation to have for a light conversation than talking about um, the new fast for rollout that is coming out, hopefully really soon, and um, state aid, right? Um, and when I say that, again, we are looking at having maybe an informal conversation, keeping it really light. What we are mostly interested in is being able to hear from you all who are in that sort of um, in the mix of uh, financial aid and state aid and really hearing what the impact could be for our scholarship program for our scholars who do have access to state aid um, or if there's any other um, lameness um, functions that happen from the FOSTA rollout that could affect our scholarship and the way the students receive our awards. Um, but it'll be casual, we won't make it too heavy. Um, and as Hayne mentioned earlier in the presentation, we may have some holiday giveaways um, and we are looking at providing um, a a free conference registration for the success convening that is happening next year um, for up to four people on your staff. Um, and it'll be a full conference registration, so you don't have to pay that. I want to make it completely clear, we are only covering the registration fee, um, not the flights or hotels, right? So that will, that will still be on you to sort of figure out. Um, but we are looking at some kind of way of giving that kind of a giveaway, maybe some prizes, maybe a little quiz, maybe a little, little trivia game or something um, next month so that we can um, hopefully make that available to, to you and your campus. And I think with that, I'm, I'm pretty much done. I will hand it over back to Hayne. All right, thank you, Chris. Uh, just a quick reminder on the state aid piece, we'll talk more informally in December, but uh, many of you may have noticed in the PC Weekly that we had been asking for state aid information from you all. Thank you to those who had a chance to fill it out. If you haven't and you have that link handy on you, please take a minute to fill it out. Uh, we are keeping more close track of our students and how many are eligible applying and receiving state aid. We know this experience varies greatly by state because we are a nationwide uh, program, but we do want to ensure that our students are maximizing the public funds that are available to them and should be awarded to them. And so uh, thank you to, again, those who filled out that a survey really quick and then just a quick heads up that we will be communicating to students in the next couple of weeks as well as our applicants just to remind them that they should be applying to state aid, uh, that they should be working with their scholar advisors or seeking supports on campus to make sure that they have the right resources and information to complete those applications. You know, the more state aid our students receive, that's more funding that they may have for a future. If they go get down the line and need to take a couple extra classes, for example, that's more scholarship funds that they have available. And also that's more unused funds that can go towards funding a future prospective scholar as well. Uh, this information will also all be in the PC Weekly tomorrow, just as a reminder, uh, with all of the slides, with all of this information shared here today. So uh, thank you, Gabby, for dropping that link to the Google Sheet in the chat. Uh, we will stick around, as always, for a couple of minutes. If you have any and all questions uh, regarding the program, please feel free to ask them. Otherwise, thank you again to our guest speakers. Mahir, I'm so sorry that I misspelled your last name on the slide. I will get that rectified before we send it out to the community. And thank you all for joining us during such a busy time of the year. Thank you again.